Welcome to the first London hug of 2020. Could I get some feedback just to make sure people can actually hear me? Could you just put hi in the in the chat bot or <clears throat> just say hello? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can see it. Everybody's there. This is really exciting. We've got um, 90 people on online. We've got um, approximately four or 500 people um, registered for this event, so we'll probably get some more as we go along. Um, everybody knows, uh, hopefully, why we're here, why we're doing this as a digital event, and it's a shame that we can't all meet in person, but the situation is what it is, and those people who know me understand how pragmatic I am, and, and we're actually looking at this as, as, a, as a positive thing so that we can reach out to a, to a larger audience. For those who don't know me, my name is Cluid. I'm the CEO of White Hat. We are a uh, HubSpot partner agency based in West London, and we are responsible for the Central London Hug. And that's really all I'm going to be um, saying about us today. I want to move rapidly on to the presentation. Um, we've got about an hour um, to talk today. We're going to be covering a, a, a topic that is really fascinating and incredibly relevant uh, for anybody who's who's using the HubSpot platform, anybody who's doing digital marketing, we're talking about attribution reporting. It's one of the main reasons why people go to a system like HubSpot and specifically to HubSpot itself now. Um, and it's a feature of the enterprise system. So we're, um, we're really lucky to be able to have um, Ari involved uh, in this. And Ari is based out of the Dublin office and is a senior product manager at HubSpot. And he's going to talk us through attribution reporting and also give us an update on everything else that's happening at, uh, at HubSpot. And if he gives us an update on everything that's happening at HubSpot, we'll probably be here for the rest of the day. So hopefully that's going to be a, a summary. Um, so that's it for now. Put questions into the chat. I will be monitoring them. Um, we've also got Megan from Dublin monitoring um, chat. So we'll jump in there. We'll try and ask, answer questions as we go along. Um, also, we'll, we'll have some time at the end of the session so you can fire off stuff at Ari directly. So, so that's it from me. I'm going to mute myself now and pass over to Ari Plow. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Cluid, for your adaptability. I feel like we're all with uh, everything that's going on these days. We're working in different ways than we have before, and uh, we appreciate you as the host. Uh, so we're going to jump right in. We're gonna talk about attribution reporting fundamentals. Before we do that, I had posted this question of what we're excited about. I came into work this morning and this is the picture that I took out my window at the office. And it was like, just a good reminder that there's beauty in the world, even though there's craziness all around, no matter what the papers say. So feeling excited about this, feeling positive, like Jesse was saying that it's spring and the sun is shining in Dublin. So without further ado, my name is Ari. I am a product marketer. I've been at HubSpot for eight years. They haven't found a reason to kick me out just yet. Just got married in the last year, moved to Ireland, and I like being active. So I'm a hiker, a biker, a knitter, and a part-time occasional yogi. Uh, I'm a little bit sick just coming off from being sick. So while I look like this in real life, I actually feel a little more like this and I might sound a little more like this. So I appreciate you all bearing with me through the presentation today. Uh, so I was hoping today to be in London with you in person, but I'm not able to be in London the last time I was in London, I looked like this. So that's me on the left and my older brother on the right. I have, my wife always says that I used to be so cute and she doesn't know what happened. But when I was, last time I was in London, I looked like this. Since I've been in Dublin for the last year, I've been all around the UK to explore, but I haven't been to London. So I've been to Bath and to Glasgow and to various other places, but I was hoping to make it to London today. I couldn't make it to London today, but I was hoping that virtually we could keep the London love going. And for my next trip, that you guys could help me to plan my next trip to London. Um, I feel like every time I even think about planning a trip to London, I get overwhelmed because it's so big and all the neighborhoods. So help me out. What we're gonna do today is as we go every few slides to keep you all awake and to make sure that my next trip to London totally kicks butt. I'm gonna bring up a specific topic about London. I'm gonna ask for recommendations and I would love it if you could email me, ari at hubspot.com with your recommendations. So at the end, We'll have maybe three or four of these. You can send them each as we go, or you can group them all into one email, send it to me at the end with any questions you have about the presentation. We'll pick a couple winners and we'll send you guys some swag. So London recommendations, email it to me. We'll pick some uh, folks for swag. Let's start. 
if uh, remember Ari at HubSpot.com, best cafe in London for next time I'm there. Give you guys 10 seconds. Start writing that email. We look forward to getting it. Well, Helen says, I missed a lot of East Central London. That's fair. My Google image searching was, uh, apparently my Google image game is off. Oh yeah, fine to put him in the Zoom chat. Would also love to get him in my email as well, just to make sure we track who we can give the swag to afterwards. Cool. So keep an eye on that. Best Cafe was the first one. Uh, we'll have an, another few questions coming along through. Let's get right into it. We'll talk about attribution fundamentals. We'll talk about what else is new in HubSpot. We won't be here all day, Clued, don't worry. Uh, we'll get to questions, and then we'll peace out, and we'll head over to what I like to call our virtual, virtual happy hour, our virtual hors d'oeuvres, which we'll have in the HubSpot community for any other questions that come up. One other question before we get started, a quick icebreaker on attribution reporting specifically. Uh, you can drop this one into the chat, no need to email me this one. How familiar are you with attribution reporting? One is, is that the new Mission Impossible movie? You have never really done attribution or heard too much about it. Two, you know enough to be dangerous. And three, pull over and let me drive this webinar. All right, Gil's a one. Nice, Chris, Ruth as well. All right, a couple threes coming through, but a lot of folks, ooh, Greg is a four. He's like, get this HubSpotter out of here. It's two, Ruth, one. All right, nice. So a lot of folks have kind of heard about it, but maybe don't know, don't know all the nuances. So my hope is today that for folks that are brand new, we're gonna start from scratch. Uh, you'll learn the basics, you'll learn how to do it in HubSpot. And for folks who have done it a lot before, my hope is that you'll still come away with something new to apply that maybe you didn't know before. So when I think of attribution reporting, obviously there's only one thing that comes to mind, which is football. So what do I mean by that? Let's imagine a football play. Let's say that the ball starts with the goalie, goalie tosses it up to the defender, uh, kicks it into the midfielder, up to the forward who lofts in that perfect cross, and then the striker heads the ball home. Goal, beautiful, amazing. The question then is who deserves the credit for that goal? There's any, like, any number of ways that we could look at that. The traditional way is to give all the credit to the goal scorer. That's the Ronaldo, that's the Messi, that's the Wayne Rooney's of the world, right? And the question we ask there is, who scored the most goals? That's the metric we see in the newspaper, that's the metric we see in the program when we go to the stadium, who scored the most goals? But that's not the only way to look at it. Another traditional way to look at it is to give 100% of the credit for that goal to the forward, the, the man or woman who lofted up the cross that got headed into the net. Because without that cross, the goal would have never been scored. And so we call that metric assists. We have goals, we have assists. There's no better or worse metric to measure. They're just different. It depends what you're optimizing for. Different players, in this case, have a different role on different parts of the field. So who are the most assists? There's any number of ways we could measure this. Goals and assists are the most traditional. We could give credit to any number of players all the way even back to the goalie. Like without that first pass into the field, the goal would have never been scored. Uh, Steve says, Steve Gerrard never won a title, so he gets no credit. All right, fair enough. Did have a lot of assists though, uh, but I, I appreciate the comment there. So anyways, we, uh, we could give credit to any number of players on the field. It just depends what we're trying to optimize for. Question here is why even count? Like, why does this matter for the players? Why does this manager? Uh, why does this matter for the manager? Like, who even cares? Why might why, why why count these metrics? For the players, it's all about recognition. So, if the players count goals, if we count assists, then the players can demand bigger contracts. They can demand more playing time. Right? They can demand more endorsements. It's all about recognition about understanding what, what role they play so that they can have more recognition from fans and from the, the team. For the manager, it's about optimization. So if you know that the Steve Gerrard and the uh, Wayne Rooney are up front and they score the most goals and they get the most assists, you can put those players in the right place at the right time to score even more goals in the future. And then for both of them, it's about leverage. So if you're counting goals and assists, it'll give you more leverage to ask ownership for more money. It'll give you more leverage to ask the community for a new stadium. Right? It's all about leverage for both of those. It's a seat at the table with leadership. You can imagine where I'm going with this. 
we can apply that same idea, that same concept of credit and attribution to customer journeys. So if we only give credit to the goal score, that's the Wayne Rooney's of the world, the thing that happens right before the conversion happens in this case, we're only gonna give credit to the sales team. And so for us, I'm a marketer, for us as marketers, we miss out on a whole big part of the story, everything that happens before the sale gets made. So same question here, if we can identify those metrics, the goals, the assists, and all the other attribution, why does that matter for marketers like me? And then why does that matter for marketing leaders? Well, you guessed it, it's the same as, as the soccer analogy, the football analogy. So for the marketer, it's about recognition. So if I, as a marketer, can prove which individual touch points I created along the way that contributed to revenue, I can ask for a raise, I can ask for more responsibility, I can ask for more headcount on my team, it's all about recognition. Uh, for the marketing leader, it's about optimization. So if we know that certain sources or certain assets are doing the most work to actually drive revenue, to drive goals being scored, we can put those pages and those channels in position to succeed the next time around. And then for both, it's about leverage. So just like a football team wants leverage with ownership, they want leverage with the community. Uh, we as marketers and as marketing teams, we want leverage with the sales team. We want leverage with leadership. We want budget. We want headcount and so on and so forth. If we tie what we do to dollars, then we get leverage. That's all we can really ask for. All right, on the football analogy here, remember Ari at HubSpot.com. Email these to me, we'll hand out some swag after the fact. Yeah, next time I'm in London, what's the best sporting venue, the best place to watch a match? Could be a bar or a pub, could be an actual venue. I'd love to hear it. I'm born and raised in and around Boston, so I'm used to going to Fenway Park for baseball games. But would love a new, a new sport and a new place to check out next time I'm in London. All right. We got that under control. Oh, I see Wimbledon. I would love to go to Wimbledon. That's a lifelong dream of mine. I like that we have different answers. You guys have a ton of amazing, the O2, West Ham, Wembley, a ton of amazing things happening in London. I feel like Ireland, I don't know, Meg can speak to Ireland as well, but we have, a, we have like two, two solid stadiums. Emirates Stadium, the Oval, Fulham FC. Nice. Keep those recommendations coming. Keep them coming to my email and ask questions along the way. Thank you guys for staying awake. Whoever was the one that said Starbucks coffee is what they're most excited about, it's working. Everyone's still awake. All right, moving on. So that's the concept of attribution. Uh, attribution is all about giving credit where credit is due so that we can have leverage, so that we can optimize as managers, uh, and so that we can get credit as marketers for the work we do. I wanna walk you through a specific example with a real HubSpot customer. This is a customer called A3C. A3C is a music festival that's based, it's in the States, it's based in Atlanta, Georgia. They have been a HubSpot customer for a while. They have really avid fans who come year after year. One of their newest fans I want you to meet is named Bethany. And I'm gonna walk you through Bethany's journey with A3C from first introduction all the way through becoming a loyal customer. So Bethany, first thing she did, she's from Atlanta, Georgia, and she wanted to find things to do around Atlanta in the fall. So she Googled things to do in Georgia in October. She ended up finding A3C's website, went to A3C's website, explored a little bit, just clicked her on the, on the blog, and then she left. So she Googled it. That's what we in HubSpot will call her first interaction. Next up, a week later, she saw a Facebook ad on her Facebook feed about A3C. She clicked on the ad, she perused the website again. I checked out the lineup a little bit. This time she ended up subscribing to their blog. So she signed up for more information. That's the second key touch point. That first interaction, second key touch point. Signed up for the blog, threw an ad. We call that in HubSpot, that's the moment that her lead in the system was created. So in the CRM, the lead was created via clicking an ad. The third key touch point, uh, Bethany clicked a tweet. So a week later, she just clicked a tweet on A3C's feed. She explored a little bit. This time she found the lineup. She found that you could sign up to get in line for tickets. So tickets weren't on sale, but you could reserve your place in line to get tickets when they did go on sale. So she ended up doing that. That was a, a moment of purchase intent. So she showed that she was really interested in uh, actually purchasing tickets. So in HubSpot, A3C has HubSpot CRM and they create a deal in HubSpot. That's the third key moment. That first interaction, that moment the lead gets created, and then now because she reserved tickets, a deal gets created. And finally, she signed up for notifications. She gets that email 
that tickets are on sale. She buys a ticket. And that's when in HubSpot, the deal goes to closed one. So that deal gets closed. Total purchase, 800 bucks. Um, oh, I see Kirsty, is there a phone number we can dial in? Uh, Megan and Clute, I would ask you guys to follow up just to make sure Kirsty can get in okay. Thank you. All right, so recap of Bethany's situation. First interaction was she Googled it. Second interaction, lead created, she clicked an ad, ended up surfing the blog, filling out a form. That third interaction, clicked a tweet, ended up back on the site, reserved her spot online. Fourth interaction, bought the ticket by clicking an email. Four key interactions. That's the way that she saw it. The way that we see it in HubSpot, one way that we might look at it is what we could call uh, through an, a source of those interactions. So that first Google search, that first interaction, we call organic search. There's an organic search sourced interaction. When that lead was created, clicked on an ad on Twitter, we call that a paid social ad. Third, organic social, she clicked on a tweet, a deal was created, and then finally got that email, ended up uh, going closed one on the deal uh, through email. Uh, Matt, good question. Uh, Matt asks, really useful webinar. Watched a lot of this on a recent webinar with Ari and Scott Bricker. Uh, Matt, good question. Going through a little bit of the same material at the beginning here with the football analogy, we'll have a bunch of new stuff later on new features in HubSpot. So you're welcome to stick around. Uh, we'll also be sending out the recording, so we'll leave that up to you. All right, so the idea here is we have these four key interactions from Bethany. All we're doing, just like in the football play, is assigning percentages of credit for first lead, deal created, and for closed one, and assigning dollar values to each of those interactions as well. So the same way on the football field, we were giving assists to that second to last or goals just to that last final conversion before the goal was scored. Same idea, same concept here for the customer journey from the marketing perspective. The way that we assign credit in football, we have goals and assists. In marketing, we have attribution models. So all an attribution model is, is it's a way of giving credit to different touch points along the way. There's a dozen different ones of these. You can do all of these that we see here and more inside of HubSpot or inside of Google Analytics or whatever other tool you might be using. Uh, the main point here is there's a number of different ways to do it. There's no best way to do it. So oftentimes the question is, uh, like, do I do multi-touch? Do I do single touch? Do I do first or last touch? The answer is it really depends. It's like asking, do I measure assists or do I measure goals on the football pitch? It just depends what you want to optimize for. So today I'm going to walk you through two specific examples uh, of attribution models. And they start with the question that you want to ask that you want to find an answer to. So whenever we're thinking about an attribution model, it doesn't start with a model. It starts with the question. So the first question might be, how are paying customers first finding out about the brand? So I really want to get a sense of what's bringing business in the door for the first time. And for that, we use what we call first interaction. The first interaction gives all the credit to the first touch point that has, somebody has of the brand on the way to becoming a customer. And so we call that single touch because it's giving all of the credit to one single touch point. Uh, that would be like in football, giving all the credit to the goalie. So it's a different model. It's a different way than we traditionally look at it on the football pitch. But in marketing, it's actually, it's actually a really good one and a really important one. Bethany's case, organic search was that first touch point. She Googled it. She ended up finding A3C's website. So in her case, 100% of that credit, all 800 bucks in revenue would go to organic search. Uh, I'll sh show you in just a, a second how to run this report inside of HubSpot. But what we end up with is pretty straightforward. I wanted to show you the final result first, which is along the x-axis, we have the interaction source, direct traffic, email marketing, so on and so forth. On the y-axis, we have the amount of revenue from that source via that specific first interaction model that we're looking at. So in this case, if we quickly just analyze those results, we see for A3C that that first touch, the first thing that brought them new business into the website tended to be direct traffic, email marketing, paid search, so direct traffic. Somebody just came right to the website. They typed in A3C into the search bar. That's probably through just brand recognition, folks hearing from their friends coming to the site and buying tickets. But email marketing and paid search, there's some good takeaways there for the A3C marketing team. They're sending emails that are getting people to the website for the first time, buying tickets for the first time. And same with paid search. So if what they're trying to do is get net new people to buy tickets, they should really lean into email marketing and paid search. That's a really good takeaway. I think for the A3C team. 
So that's one question you can answer. Another question, first interaction, first touch is great. Love hearing about how goalies are influencing the football play. But what about the whole rest of the journey? Wiz Marketers impacts every single piece of the journey. What else? For that, we might use what we call full path attribution. So full path gives 90% of the credit, splits it among those four big interactions that we saw with Bethany. And then the other 10% goes to any other interaction that they have. So it really focuses on those big key moments, 90%, and then all the rest is split. Because there's a bunch of different interactions that we're splitting credit between, we call that a multi-touch model. So you might hear multi-touch revenue attribution thrown around. It's a really big buzzword keyword in the space right now. That's all it means. Is that instead of just giving all the credit to the goal scorer or to the assist, you're splitting credit across a number of different players on the pitch at once. So full path attribution, in Bethany's case, we take 90% of the credit and we split it across that first interaction, that lead create moment, the deal create, and then the closed one. And then let's say just in this example that she did something in between. Maybe she looked at a blog post in between when she signed up for that ticket notification and when she actually bought the ticket. We would give that 10%. So 22 and a half is just if we take the 90%, cut it in four ways, we give 180 bucks to each of those four big moments. And so here in this case, the report looks similar, but we might have a different takeaway. So first we saw that email marketing and paid search were bringing people into the door. Uh, they were bringing new business into the door for the first time. In this case for A3C, paid social is really great for this full path model. We see it's really great at driving business through the rest of the path, through the rest of the funnel. It's actually not great at bringing in new business for the first time, but like with Bethany, if you wanna influence somebody after they're already in the system and they're just considering their options along the way, paid social is really great in A3C's case. Yeah, question from, let's see, from Hannah. Can you also class these as uh, touch points? So yeah, we use, in HubSpot, we use the word interaction. Uh, touch point is another word. Sometimes we use, uh, I use those kind of interchangeably. So good question. So those are two models. That's the first interaction. That's the full path model. There's six models you can run in HubSpot, and that number is growing every day. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. And uh, it's like assists. It's like goals on the football pitch. There's no right or wrong answer. It just depends what you're trying to optimize for. We saw two questions. Every other model has a different question that you can answer. All right, we well, talked about music. We've talked about football. We've talked about cafes. Next time I come to London, the best place to go for live music, best live music venue. And ari at hubspot.com, A-R-I at hubspot.com. Send them to me, put them in Zoom if you'd like. That's great as well. Blue's Kitchen. Nice, good tips, everyone. Come and see us, Ben. Oh, we've got bands and DJs based in Wimbledon too. Okay, so Ben, you have bands and DJs, you're not in the band. Also comment here if you're in a band that I should come and see next time I'm in London, I would love to hear that too. Nice. Oh, Ben plays in bands too. Nice, Ben. You know my email address. Send me some of your music. Would love to listen. All right, so question coming in from Fred and maybe from a couple others. Uh, attribution is available. The revenue attribution that we're talking about here for the most part is in Marketing Hub Enterprise. There are pieces of it, and especially we talk about revenue attribution versus what we might call contact attribution. So the, the kind of first half of this equation where we're figuring out how contacts get in the database from first and last touch. That contract, contact, contact attribution is available in professional. The revenue attribution for the most part is available in enterprise. So good question there as well. Um, a couple quick tips here. I'm not a big fan of long extended best practice sections. So I'm keeping that, uh, keeping that to a minimum here. But first, start small. I think attribution, a lot of us are at ones in terms of understanding and comprehension of attribution. It can be really complicated and technical but it doesn't have to be. So I like to say start small, even if just getting to 10% of the answers or 20% of the answers, you don't have to get to 100% all at once. So even just getting one takeaway from one model, making one strategic change to marketing based on what you learn here, is totally worth it. So at HubSpot, 
obviously we have a 300 person marketing team. We have more complex attribution going on. But when we started, we just used that first touch model. We were trying to drive as many new customers into the door as we could. And that first touch model is a great way to figure out what's driving new business. So we started with that. And since then we've expanded to more of the multi-touch models. Own a revenue number. So I'm a marketer. Part of the reason I'm not in sales is I'm really scared of quotas. Quotas are scary. Owning a number, having a really direct tie into revenue is a really scary thing. And I think for marketers, it's especially scary, but we also have to recognize that there's a reason that sales reps make the biggest checks for the most part at the end of every month. And it's because when you get tied directly into revenue, you have leverage. And so the takeaway here is own a revenue number as a marketing team. So assign each team a channel or each team member a channel, assign each team member a goal, set up some kind of an SLA with sales to make sure that uh, you have prompt follow-up on leads and that you're sending them the kind of leads they need. The example here is a customer we have called a new breed. They're based in the States as well. And they use attribution, but in addition to just using attribution, they've used it to completely shift the paradigm for their marketing team. So each marketer owns a revenue number. They hit the revenue number. And as a result of that, they've been able to show leadership, really amazing growth that directly ties to business revenue. And so they've seen good results. They've seen increased revenue, which is great, but they've also seen increased leverage. So they've upped their team size by 30%. They've upped their marketing team budget in 2020 by 70% because they were able to tie directly to revenue, just like a sales team would. Next up, process first. Uh, data integrity comes before reporting. So I like to say, whether it's HubSpot, Google Analytics, whatever tool you use, the, the tool, the tech can't solve for bad data. So if you don't have a process, oftentimes people come into the reports in HubSpot and maybe it's blank and they're like, HubSpot, it's wrong. You know, there must be something wrong with the tech. Is there a bug? And the answer is, you gotta have the right process first. So you have to have a CRM in place. You have to have sales actually using and adopting the CRM. You have to have a, a process in place that's consistent for deals getting created. Deals, uh, you can only tie revenue back to marketing if revenue is actually being logged in a consistent way. For deals to be created, for them to be associated to people and to contacts in HubSpot or in your system of record. That's on the sales side, on the marketing side tracking codes on all pages, naming conventions, all the things maybe we take for granted, but to get really clean revenue reporting, all of that has to be just right. Next up, manage your stakeholders. I just ran a product launch as a marketer in uh, January, and I said 90% of the battle here is communication. I think that's especially true at a big company. The work itself is important. The communication of that work and the communication of the results is equally important in the process. So tell, team, tell teams what to expect beforehand. Create dashboards. You can create dashboards out of this attribution data. Create them ahead of time. Set a cadence of email sends. So for mine, I'm sending emails to the HubSpot leadership. Day of launch, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And I'm sticking to that. Get a permanent spot in the exec meeting. So at HubSpot, we have an executive meeting. We also have a, a marketing meeting that we have every month. And we as a product marketing team, as much as we can, get in front of those groups just to communicate out our results. One way in HubSpot that we enable this, you see on the right-hand side, is a uh, share dashboard. So we have the ability for any of your dashboards. There's a button that just says share. You can set up a recurring email cadence. So in this case, I have it set up to go out recurring every week, Monday morning. That's a snapshot of the revenue attribution from campaigns. This is one example, but you could do it monthly to the leadership. You could do it weekly or daily to your marketing team or to your sales team really handy feature there. Connect your data. The work through a single platform, for the most part, we're HubSpot users here. I think we maybe all are using HubSpots in some way for that. Maybe some of us are using Salesforce or another system, but the more data is connected through a single place, the better. And I think that should be for obvious reasons when we're talking about attribution, there's so many different touch points that happen. If for every touch point, you have to wire something new between systems, it's just never gonna work, you're gonna be in trouble. So use HubSpot, we love HubSpot. We think that it's got this great single contact record that can tie in most, if not all of your marketing data. Use tools like PySync, which we'll talk about in a second, and Zapier to make sure whatever system of record you're using, that data gets into the right fields in order to make this stuff work. 
All right, so questions came up. I'll talk through in a second about how to set these up, but uh, the quick CTA here is if you have a Marketing Hub Enterprise attribution, it's already included, check it out. If you don't sign up for a trial, there's obviously no commitment. It goes without saying, explore it, try it. If you're in professional and you don't feel like starting an enterprise trial, check out the attribution features in professional, see what you think, take a good first step there, get some cool results. Uh, and that's a big win for you and for us as well. So it's the third piece of the CTA that goes inside. All right, quick steps here to get this set up if you're following along at home. And of course, we'll send out these slides as well. Step one is to get to the builder. So from any dashboard inside of HubSpot, you can click Add Report. You can also get there if you're in your Reports nav, click on Reports in the top navigation and down into the Reports home. There's a Create Report button there as well. Um, click Attribution. And so from here, if you're in Professional, you'll see a revenue attribution and a contact attribution toggle, uh, or sorry, in professional, you would just see contact attribution. You wouldn't see the revenue attribution, whereas in enterprise, you would see both. Step three, start with uh, the templates. So in HubSpot, we built, I, I think one of the things that I love about HubSpot the most of the many is that we, we're prescriptive. So we don't just give you a tool and throw you off into the deep end. We start with best practices. So all the questions that we get asked from an attribution perspective, we've aggregated those into uh, some templates that you can start with. So you can click between the templates. It makes the report for you as you go, which is super slick. If you like the templates, stick with the templates. If not, you can build something custom as well. So at the top of that builder, there's an Explore tab you can see on the left here, and a Configure tab. Under the Configure tab, you have all the different levers you might need from uh, the type of chart that you're looking at to the deals. So maybe you just want to look at, you know, the deals that were closed in the last month to attribute, or maybe it's the deals that are in a certain industry or in a certain persona or of a certain size. So you could cut that down here. And then the final piece here is dimension. So we looked in that example from A3C at the original source, organic, so on and so forth. You could also cut that by the type content, blog post versus landing page versus website page. Uh, you could cut that by the deal pipeline, There's any number of dimensions that you could cut that by. And then finally, a model. So we looked at first interaction and full, full path. There's, I think, six or eight models that you can choose from here, depending on how you want to assign your credit across the football pitch. Step five, you save your report. You can either save it to a dashboard or you can save it on its own. And that's it. So I'll send out these slides. If you all have questions, uh, we'll be in the community answer specifically about this, and we'll move on from attribution in just a second. Uh, final question here on London Rex. I'm all about bang for buck. I don't know if that's, maybe that's a, a US idiom. Bang for buck, I mean our best uh, value for our money in terms of uh, dinner out. Uh, activates as McDonald's. Classic answer, I haven't tried that before. Is it good? No, I'm only kidding. Dip and flip, nice. Keep them coming through Zoom and through Ari at HubSpot.com as well. We'll get the swag flowing too. The Ivy Pizza Pilgrim's best 10 pounds you can spend in London. Thanks, Bill. Ooh, again, Pizza Pilgrim's from Steve. Disagree, Franco Manca, okay, all right. Pizza Union, ooh, I feel like we got a, we got a pizza beef on our hands here. Nice, guys, these are great. I feel like I'm gonna spend like two weeks in London. I'm never gonna get bored. We got sporting venues, we got cafes, we got live music. We got value for our money with McDonald's from, a, from the team here, perfect. Keep these coming and feel free to send them to my email as well. I feel like I'm getting more out of this presentation than you all are, this is amazing. All right, that's about attribution. Again, we'll be in the community for our, our informal hors d'oeuvres, drinks, happy hour afterwards. So. Drop questions in there as you have them. I, I think I didn't get to all of them from the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, what else is new? Ooh, Hawksmore does better steak. Blacklock does amazing steak. Need to ask the best pub recommendations. Ruth, good point. If, if y'all have pub recommendations, send those as well. I feel like in Dublin, I've gotten my fair share of good pubs, but would love to come to pubs in London as well. All right, what else is new? So the way that we're thinking about new products in HubSpot this year, you've seen it with this Marketing Hub Enterprise launch in the last few months. We like to think about HubSpot uniquely positioned in the market 
there's the easy and then there's the powerful the small business solutions of the world are really easy but they're not that powerful these legacy enterprise systems mostly crms are really powerful but they're really clunky and complex hubspot is the nice balance in between those two so it's really easy to use but it's also got the power baked in so as you grow you can run all the business process that you need so that's as we see the new features these are this is the way that we're thinking about the paradigm we're using to think about new feature launches this year we've got a lot of great customers using hubspot where as we think about especially bigger customers these are folks that you know recognize and love on to the new features this is this is where the fun part happens uh, partitioning. So partitioning is a marketing hub enterprise feature. It's in beta right now. The essential idea is if you have a big company, you have different teams in different regions, you have different business units, um, you can separate out assets between teams. And so this is a security feature and a convenience feature. Inside, it's an internal facing feature. It doesn't affect customers at all, but it makes it a lot easier to run a team and keep a team organized inside of HubSpot. So that's partitioning. You can do that for essentially all of the different features inside of HubSpot. You can separate out pages. You can separate out workflows by team. Uh, you can separate out emails by team. Uh, and one other feature to mention here as a part of partitioning, we're also rolling out a, a high demand feature, which is you can actually separate out email preference pages. So up until now, you've only been able to have one set of email subscriptions. So if somebody within an email clicks on the email, to set their preferences, they see every single preference you have. So for HubSpot, that means in our own emails, you know, the inbound events, the hug events, uh, product updates, all those subscriptions are in the same set. You can imagine a world where you actually want to separate those out. Maybe you have different brands completely and you don't want somebody who, you know, in the States, maybe we have KFC and Taco Bell and they're part of the same conglomerate but they're completely different brands. You wouldn't want those preference centers to be merged together. You would want them separate. With partitioning, you can do that. So if somebody unsubscribes from one brand, from one team, they don't unsubscribe to the entire portal email. So these are a big win, I think, especially for bigger teams inside of HubSpot. Adaptive testing. One of my favorite new features in HubSpot, I think it's, it's just slick. So A-B testing, I think folks may, maybe are familiar with. In A-B testing, you have two different variations of a page, one blue, one red maybe. You put them up against each other, you test them out, see which one performs better, and then at the end you go in, you whip out your, if you're like me, the statistical significance calculator, you Google that every time, and you use that to figure out which version is actually better, and if you can be sure of that. You pick the winner, and then that moves forward as the winner, and that stays for 100% of the test. Adaptive testing takes that and makes it completely automated. So instead of, setting up the test manually and going in with your calculator and picking a winner at the end, adaptive testing picks the winner for you, which is super nice. You don't waste the time, you don't waste the effort of picking the winner. And the other cool piece of adaptive testing is that you don't, if you think about a traditional A-B test, a traditional A-B test gives 50% of the traffic to both variations. And that's great, but it means that even if one variation is performing way better, you're still giving 50% of the traffic to the worst performing variation. So the idea with adaptive testing, because it uses ML, it continuously optimizes that test. So little by little, it gives more and more of the traffic to the better performing page until finally it picks the winner. So it saves you time because it takes out the manual part and it also saves you conversions because it optimizes as you go instead of splitting the traffic 50-50 the whole time. So that's a super cool feature. It's live to everybody. Uh, it's a Marketing Hub Enterprise. If you just want to run standard A-B tests, that's in Marketing Hub Professional as well, and you can run that there. Statistical Significance Calculator. Yep, clue. That's, I feel like I've used that one 100 times in my life. Super helpful. Traditional A-B tests, really, really valuable if you're not doing any testing at all, but adaptive testing is just even the next layer deeper of experimentation in marketing. Well, account based marketing, we've heard a lot about this. Excuse me, just one sec. Here's my uh, acting and sounding like a toad coming back in. We've heard a lot about this in the States and uh, in Europe, as we've explored as well. If you, you're B2B, you sell into big businesses, you have big, large deals coming in. The deal size is really big. Chances are you're running an ABM program, whether you even know it or not. Um, ABM and HubSpot has always been possible, but it hasn't been 
uh, super obvious. A question coming in from Lucy, is this just focused on the enterprise package? It's not the first couple of features happen to be enterprise, but we'll talk about other features throughout as well. Uh, account-based marketing is in professional and enterprise, and it's actually across all the hubs in sales and service hub as well. So be mindful of that. Uh, account-based marketing, it's been possible in HubSpot, but it hasn't always been easy. It's just a lot easier now. So one big feature there is company scoring, so company level scoring. You've always been able to score leads, but you haven't always been able to score companies on accounts. So if you're doing business with companies, it's really important that you qualify them too. And that's a really awesome new feature that's available uh, in professional and in enterprise as well. Uh, one more enterprise feature here, conversational marketing. So you actually have conversations. You can set up a live chat widget on your website. That's in the free version of HubSpot. So in the free version, all the way up through enterprise, you can set up a live chat, set up Facebook Messenger, have a really good conversational experience on the website. What's new in the enterprise version specifically is really deep targeting for those conversational widgets. So we, you can target based on the examples we have here on a segmented list. That could be folks from a certain place, that could be folks of a certain persona, would see a certain chat widget, device type, smartphone, you know, uh, desktop, iPad, whatever it is, or a session count. So if they've been to the website before and you wanna show them as a, a repeat visitor, a completely different chat, you can do that. So live chat is available again to everybody in HubSpot. You get various levels of functionality as you go up in the tiers, but this is the newest piece that's just in the enterprise version, which is uh, the super slick targeting. Uh, PySync, we bought this company called PySync last year. A big question that comes up is, does HubSpot sync with feature X? And the answer is often yes, but often, uh, often it's not. And PySync with now built into HubSpot, they're part of the HubSpot family. We're building out features alongside them. You can sync 200 additional apps with HubSpot. And so the examples you see here is uh, all the different apps that you can sync. And then the setup here is super slick. You just have out of the box field mappings and you can add your own custom field mappings as you go. So if you've ever synced HubSpot with Salesforce or any other system, looks really familiar with PySync, super easy field mappings. Uh, PySync is, it's available as an add-on. I think it starts at nine bucks a month. And as a HubSpot user, I actually get a discount on that. So I think it's down to like seven bucks a month. Um, no requirement that you use it, but it's a really awesome feature if you're looking to set up syncs with other tools that are in your stack. Here's a feature uh, for Lucy. This one's in, in marketing of starter and above. Uh, we brought drag and drop email editing. So if you all create emails in HubSpot, you can drag and drop your templates, uh, your modules into place now. That's email is all the way down to free. So you can edit your emails all the way down to free. We brought that same awesome drag and drop editor into pages. So if you're in marketing hub starter or above, you can drag and drop modules into your pages. Super slick, super easy. Uh, no code required. You don't have to go into the design manager or get a developer to edit a template or anything like that. Uh, that's in starter and above, so you should play around with that. I was just actually creating a page, building a website for, I'm sure there's a number of us in the room as well, building a website for my mom, and I was using this drag and drop uh, page editing system, and it was uh, just a joy to use. So check it out, would recommend. Another one here, live to all accounts, not just enterprise, it's all the way down to free. Canva button. I don't know if folks have used Canva. I use Canva a whole lot in my life as a marketer because I, I'm not good with photo editing software. The Canva button brings the Canva fo photo editing, image editing interface directly inside of HubSpot. And so when you, oop, I didn't even update the, the copy here, but you guys get the drift. When you're creating an email, when you're creating a landing page, you can click on a button that says edit with Canva. Uh, you, you go to add an image, click that button, edit with Canva, and then the Canva interface, just like you can see here, it pops up over HubSpot. So you auth into your Canva account, you create your button or whatever it is, you insert it into HubSpot, and it brings you right back into the same place you left off. So super slick here. I've played around with this. Uh, I just saw actually Darmesh emailed the whole company the other day saying that for his website, he just made a new image with a Canva button and absolutely loves it as well. So if you're doing photo editing and you find yourself in Photoshop or InDesign a lot, try the Canva button. Canva is a, not, uh, it's a third party source, a resource, it's free. So give it a try. Excuse me, a couple more here. 
Uh, Steve says, use the Canva button. It's awesome. Five year Canva user. 100% Steve, love that. Um, questions coming in also from Alice, from Hannah, uh, from Chris. I want to get through all the updates we have, and then we can either take those questions live or we can take them through the community offline. But I do see those questions coming in. Thank you for sending, keep sending those. Um, workflow updates. Workflows is automation in HubSpot. That's in Pro and Enterprise, and it's across all the hubs. A few updates that I think went a little bit under the radar but are super exciting. Uh, with workflows, you can now merge branches. So oftentimes, you have a branching logic to take different contacts or deals down different paths, and you end up in a place where all the paths kind of converge, where everybody after a certain point gets the same set of emails, for example. But in HubSpot, you always had to separate out the paths and create those same paths again and again on each of those distinct branches. Uh, now we have a feature, we call it uh, merging branches, or it's called it's an action in workflows called the go-to action, which allows you from one branch to go to a branch, another branch. And so instead of recreating that same branch over and over again, you can just merge the branch and get everybody back onto the same path later on. Uh, other things here, copying contact pro uh, properties to other objects. So this was a, a big ask just in terms of data management. One example here is like, you have a contact going through and maybe you want everybody who fills out the demo form, you want a deal to get created and assigned to a sales rep, but you want that deal to have a bunch of information from the form submission. You know, the size of the company, the name of the company, the person's first name and last name, whatever it is. Um, you can now copy those from a contact record, uh, contact onto a deal through workflows. And so that kind of cross object automation has been a really big win for our customers so far. A few others here, uh, combine conditions, create folders, uh, a subfolder is a good question. Uh, I'll follow up with the team and, and get you an answer on that. Um, I think folders was the big first step and then subfolders from there. Uh, view revisions, I think this is a big one even just in the last couple weeks. We're used to using Google Docs, Google Sheets, where you can just see what version was live when a certain thing happened. And I think the big question with workflows is often, why did somebody not get a certain thing? And being able to view revisions, you can see what, you know, on a certain timestamp, what a workflow looked like and who updated it last. And I think that's super helpful, especially as a, the person that runs the HubSpot account or the admin or the ops user, that's especially useful. Forecasting property. This is actually just new yesterday. I don't even know if we've announced this. Um, you can do deal forecasting in HubSpot in all HubSpot subscriptions all the way down to free. Uh, the forecast has always been a little bit confusing because the forecast in HubSpot pulls from deals. You have your deal stages and the deal stages have a percentage to close. So you might have a demo stage for your deals that's 60% to close or 40% to close. And so the forecast that we run in HubSpot and the default kind of forecasting model, uh, model and report multiplies that percent by the value of the deal, adds that all up and puts it into the forecast widget. Even just explaining it, it's a little bit confusing. So a lot of folks have asked for something that's a little bit easier to approach for sales reps and we now have that. And so this new forecasting property, it's a default property in all HubSpot accounts now that's called manual forecast category uh, and it just, instead of using percentages and tying to deal stages, it makes a sales forecast based on uh, the perspective of the rep. So they can say what's their best case for a certain deal. Most likely they're gonna close that deal. They'll commit to closing that deal or the deal is already closed versus using the deal stages. So uh, for folks that are doing sales forecasting, this is probably something that's familiar, gives you flexibility. It's not required that you use this, but just so you all know that it's available. A couple more here, then we'll wrap up. Form analytics, just being able to export and manipulate form data, who's filled out a form over time, be able to choose multiple forms and see a report that stacks them on top of each other. That's been really needed, and now it's available. That's a professional and an enterprise. Uh, Christian asks, do we have any documentation around forecasting so we can read after the webinar? Uh, we sure do. So we announced this new feature yesterday. I haven't even, I'm the one in charge of writing the blog post for it. 
I told you all before I even wrote the blog post. So I'll write that blog post today and send it to you, Christian, as soon as we have it available. Good question. A couple more here, social post boosting. This is in professional and in enterprise. The idea is you can publish all your social through HubSpot. You can also now boost posts. So if you're familiar with Facebook ads, there's different types of ads. One is you go through the ad manager, you create ads from scratch and all that. The other is you do what's called boosting where you just take something that's been on your company feed that you posted already to your company feed and you give that a boost to slight different, uh, to different audiences. So really straightforward, you pick an audience, uh, you pick uh, a time length, you pick a budget, and now you can do that all from HubSpot. Uh, Holly says, can you send me the new forecasting doc too? Sure, we'll include that actually. We'll put that on the, on the community post that we'll be publishing shortly and that we'll send out as well. Good question from Caroline and Clara on, will this work for LinkedIn too? That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I know we initially launched it for Facebook, uh, but let me, I'll take note on that. I'll find out and I'll include that on the community post as well. Really good question. Uh, one more uh, password protected knowledge articles. So don't forget we have marketing, we have sales. We also have a service hub, starts at free, goes all the way up through enterprise as well. One of the enterprise features is that you can make a knowledge base. So if you want, a help documentation center for folks to visit and find out more about a certain thing in your product or in your services, you can create that. And now you can password protect those. So if you have a certain knowledge base article that you only want a tiny subset of your audience to be able to see, you can protect that by a specific password or you can just protect that by a certain smart list in HubSpot. So only folks on that list will be able to access that knowledge base article. So super slick way, I think that the list functionality from the marketing tool that we're all used to plays in and connects that flywheel into the service hub and the service use case as well. Uh, all right, I think that's it for me. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, so I'm, I think we'll close out here. I'm gonna send out the slides. I'm gonna send out a uh, community post that we can answer all these questions and ask additional questions. We're also gonna send out an NPS survey. Uh, so we, I would appreciate, and Meg and I know Clued would appreciate sending out, uh, filling out the NPS survey. This is something new, this virtual hug that we haven't tried uh, just yet. Say nice things, but also say honest things about how we can improve. Uh, and so that's it for me. Last question from Abigail coming in was, what's my email? It's easy, ari at hubspot.com, A-R-I at hubspot.com. I'll take questions, I'll take feature requests, I'll take recommendations from London, uh, I'll take cash, check, credit, whatever you wanna send. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you guys so much. So we'll stop the broadcast now and enjoy the rest of the day.